Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and uh, in essence of time, we'll, uh, we'll get started here. Um, my name is Lee Luchterhand. I work for Arm & Hammer Animal Nutrition as a dairy enterprise consultant in the Upper Midwest. On behalf of Arm & Hammer, I'd like to uh, welcome you all for joining us today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Wolf uh, from Michigan State. Um, the, today's seminar, just make sure, in the, make sure you're in the right room, will be uh, the effect of risk on a dairy farm management. Uh, Dr. Wolf actually, uh, even though he's been in Michigan State for the last 15 years, grew up as a local uh, boy on a dairy and beef farm over in Mineral Point, so not too far from Madison. Um, his research over at Michigan State and extension programs focuses on management, markets, and policies related to, da to dairy farming. So I guess on behalf of Arm and Hammer, I'd like to thank him for being here. Um, and uh, respect to Dr. Wolf and those sitting around you, just uh, please either silence your phones or put them on vibrate. And for those that are ARPAS members or the American Association of Veterinary Boards, there are uh, CE credits available. So on that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Wolf. Not yet? Now you can hear me. All right, great. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about risk in dairy farm management. Um, as Alan said in the previous seminar, if you were here, uh, we were invited to give these talks. It was last February, at least when I was contacted. So um, I, I gave as vague a title as I could because a lot of what I do falls under risk management, and I knew there would be plenty to talk about today. So um, I'm certainly not going to talk about everything involved in risk management, or we'd be here for several days. But I want to talk about a few things related to dairy farm management. And thanks to Arm & Hammer Nutrition for sponsoring. It's really nice of the companies to bring the speakers in here. So for today, I'm going to talk about the risk environment that dairy farms face today in the United States. And of course, a lot of what I'm going to talk about applies to a lot of other places as well. I'm going to talk about the effects that this risk has on the farm financial situation in terms of the three dimensions of farm financial well-being, liquidity, profitability, and solvency. And then I'm going to talk about some risk management decisions and give you some simple uh, analysis and ways to think about a couple of these uh, issues. So what is risk? Well, there's a lot of different definitions of risk, but I think uh, a simple one that works here is uh, risk uh, it refers to the bad things that can come from uncertainty. And anymore, we have a lot of different sources of uncertainty in farming. So for dairy farmers, milk price risk is the lost revenues from the downward price movements. If you were buying milk, it would be the opposite side, right? You'd be worried about the upward price movements. We're going to do this talk from the farmer's point of view. There's lots of different sources of risk, as I said, different types of risk. If you're a dairy farmer, you've got price risk on both sides, the output price risk for your milk, the input price risk for feed, labor, and other things of that nature. Production, also, risk applies both to the milk and to the feed. So this, especially this year with the drought, we've seen the massive amount of uh, risk that if you're growing your own feed uh, that you have on the yield risk on the, on the feed side. Financial risk, then, refers to your solvency position. Do you have enough equity to stay solvent? Do you have enough liquidity to pay the bills when they come due? And are you making a profit? Because in, in the long run, you shouldn't be just way too much work to do for nothing. Okay? And human resource risk is increasingly important as we have more hired labor and the farms get bigger. And um, of course, that doesn't have to be hired labor. You can have a human resource risk involved with your management team and others. And it's a big source of risk. And then policy institutional risk has to do with um, both international policy and trade agreements as well as the domestic policy. We're still talking about whether it's going to be a 2012 farm bill or whether it's going to be a 2013 farm bill or what's going to happen. So, and then it's not just the farm bill, it's also the environmental policies and others. So there's lots of different sources of risk. But I'm going to mostly talk about the price risk and what that has to do with financial risk. Okay, so this <clears throat> graph right here is U.S. all milk price monthly from 1991 until August or September of 2012. I can't remember which one was the most recent one when I went there. And it's adjusted for inflation. Okay, that's why it looks like that. So I'm an economist. We like to talk about things in real terms. Okay, so then it's in $2012. Okay, so if you look at this, and I tried to make the numbers small enough so nobody could see in the back of the room, but yeah, um, 
so I apologize. And there'll be some other tables like that where you'll be really happy that I made the number small. So you're welcome. So uh, this is a dollars per hundred weight, okay? And that's 30 right there. So was it $30 milk in 1961? No, it wasn't. But in 2012 dollars, it was. Okay? And here we are out here. This is 15. Okay, so there's several things, I think, that jump out at you from this graph. <clears throat> the first is that, uh, boy, milk prices were high <laughs> in the late 70s and early 80s. Okay, and there was other things going on, so it wasn't like it was just all, uh, all gravy. But milk prices were pretty darn high in that period. And this, that's 35, 40 bucks, today's dollars. Second thing is, look at the decline in real milk price over the period. And what happened was, if you recall, and I'm sure you do, that in 1983, uh, we had a support price of $13.10 a hundred weight, um, and fluctuated around that level a little bit. And the US government bought a very significant portion of the milk produced that year, in, at least in milk equivalents, in the form of products. And that was when we also were in the middle of a recession, which seemed like a bad recession until we had this most recent one. Okay. And so what happened was the government spending was cut back and they ratcheted down slowly over the years that support price, okay, and the milk prices followed it down. We also, by the way, contributing to this, had massive increases in production efficiency, okay. So we've got ma increase in cow efficiency because you guys are really good at getting milk out of cows. We had the declining support price. And we, brought the, we went from above the world prices to down to where the world prices are, um, as Alan talked about, important. And then uh, that led to the third thing, which is increasing volatility. Okay, and you'll see, that, and this is because this thing is kind of scrunched into 12 months, but you see the milk prices went up and down here. That was seasonality. We used to have pretty regular seasonality. We still have some seasonality here, but it's not regular like it was. And, that, and, and then the volatility, the massive price increases and decreases um, that characterize the situation that we're in today. So let's talk about the relative volatility of prices. So this, these are uh, prices received by farmers, which USDA National Ag Statistics Service reports. Okay. Um, this is corn, soybeans, hay, all milk. Monthly prices, this is the, the decade of the 90s. This is since 2000. This is the average price, the standard deviation, which is a measure of the spread, the variation in the distribution. And this bottom one says CV, and that's the coefficient of variation, which is what most financial economists would use as a measure of volatility. Okay, so it standardizes the volatility across the price series. So it's the standard deviation divided by the average. Okay, so a higher CV means more volatility. We had a period here, 1990 to 99, where the monthly CV on corn was 0.24, and then the last since 2000 has been 0.47, so it essentially doubled. Soybeans went from 0.15 to 0.38. Um, hay prices point, well, increased by about 67%. Uh, and the all milk price, um, which relative to these other price series, was a lot more stable. Okay? We had a situation where the milk price was much more stable than these other price series, and it doubled. Okay? So that's just for a comparison. Now we're in the world here uh, where the variation in milk prices looks more like the, the corn and the soybean variation as far as volatility levels. And of course, if you're a dairy farmer, both those affect you. You got an input side and the output side. And this is another way, and this is the last one that I'll talk about as far as volatility. This is another way of assessing the volatility. This is the, um, this goes back to 1985 through, through uh, the first eight months of 2012. And this is how much the annual average price in that year deviated from the three year moving average price. And what you'd see if I went back further was that we had a situation where the deviations were kind of not ever more than 10% or very, very rarely. Okay. And we've got an increasing, we now have deviations regularly of 20 to 25% in all milk price in annual average terms. Okay, so I'm telling you what you probably already know, there's massive amounts of volatility in the milk price. And we think about farm milk price, and this, um, the idea from this slide, I have to give credit to Andy Novakovich, who's at Cornell, 
because I, I like the way he said some of the stuff, so I adapted it. Um, there's three different dimensions of, of the farm milk price, and really this would apply to the feed price and the margin overfeed if you want to think about it that way. There's uncertainty, so the level of uncertainty in the price. There's the level of stability in the price, and then there's whether the price is adequate. And they're really related, but three different concepts. Okay, so uh, uncertainty is to what degree can you predict what the price is going to be. And this, the more unpredictable it is, the more difficult it is to make decisions. Okay, if you think about farming and the amount of capital investment that it takes uh, in a farm today, making bad capital investments is not something that you get over easily. Okay, so knowing kind of the the price climate and what the situation is is really important if you're going to make long-run investments. Okay, stability implies the, the amount to which it's moving around or not moving around. And you can have um, certain prices that are unstable. You can just know that there's, for example, going to be um, seasonal movements. So, you know, it used to be uh, fairly standard to expect that the low price would be in the spring and the high price would be in the fall and we would just kind of have a standard movement. You could kind of plan for that. Um, you can also have, um, having stability is not necessarily the best thing. Because, for example, in 2002 and 2003, we had stable milk prices because they were sitting at support. So just stability in and of itself is not necessarily what you want. And what really is the most important is whether it's adequate. Okay, is it enough money for you to, to make, make a fair return? on your labor and your investment? That's really the question. So, you know, we've got to think about handling these other situations in order to have an adequate return. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a summary of the Michigan dairy farm business analysis that we do and have been doing for um, 16, 18 years at Michigan State. Um, we have about 100, and, well, it varies, 120 to 150 farms a year that we get balance sheets and income statements from, and we do some financial benchmarking with it, and uh, it's really a uh, good set of data to use both for research and then also uh, when you go out to give talks like this or um, when people from the Michigan Department of Agriculture call and want to know what the situation is on farms and things like that. So we really appreciate the fact that we get this financial data from these farms, and we all only ever use it in summary form, so these are nobody's numbers when I put things up here. These are averages. And the top line here is rate of return on assets, which is a measure of profitability. Okay, and that's operating profit divided by the assets, the farm assets. And the reason that we use rate of return on assets is so that we can do comparisons across farm size and over time. Okay, so if we were to use net farm income and a farm had a, I told you they had $50,000 of net farm income, is that a good net farm income or not? Well, that kind of depends. If it's 20 cow dairy, that might be an outstanding net farm income. If it's a 2,000 cow dairy, that's not so great, probably. And we have farms in here that have 40 cows, 30, 40 cows, all the way up to farms that have um, 2,000 or more on this data set. So in order to make comparisons both across farms and over time, we talk about rate of return on assets. And so then this is an average, and there's lots of variation going on behind the average. If you go to the reports and they're free, online, you can download the PDF, you'll see that we break it out by herd size, and we also report the 25th and 75th percentiles um, if for comparison purposes. But I'm going to use averages here today. So uh, a couple things from this. This is the rate of return on assets. This is the milk price. So that's actually the milk price received, because that's the average across the farms of the milk price received. This is their purchase feed cost, which we have uh, from their expenses. This is the total feed cost. And in order to get total feed cost, I have to impute what they spent on their homegrown feed, or what their, like, excuse me, what their homegrown feed was worth. Okay, so I, I, that's, this isn't a hard number. This is my best estimate of what they spent based on what they grew versus what they sold, and versus what they had an inventory to begin with, and what they had an inventory to finish with, valued at what um, the feed prices are according to NAS. Okay, so here's their purchase feed. Here's the total feed cost. The difference between those two, if you were to subtract it off, would be homegrown feed. And here's income over feed cost, which is the margin between the, the milk price and the total feed cost, which is not profit, right? It would be correlated with profit, but it's not because all we paid for here is feed. Haven't paid for labor, haven't paid for anything else, haven't uh, got you a fair return 
on your management and your capital invested. So the average rate of return on assets, if you go over the past 18 years, was just a little under 7%. So uh, we get above 7%, and that was a pretty good year. And again, so you look at 2007, that one kind of jumps out. Oh, by the way, 2011 is preliminary, because last week I found another set of farms that weren't in there that should have been. Um, so these numbers might change just a little bit here. My guess is that number is going to go down a little bit. Okay, so that's preliminary for what it's worth. 2007 was an outstanding year, 11.3%. That was an average. They were farms that had 20% more or more rate of return on assets. By the way, if you're Walmart or somebody like that, you're not happy at 7% rate of return on assets because they're not capital intensive like dairy farming is. So, but 7% or, or better has been a real good year. Okay, and, and these, by the way, these farms would be biased towards the upper side of the um, management ability and financial performance. Okay. Um, so, and it used to be, if you told me what the milk price was, I could tell you whether it was a good year or not. And that pretty much told the story. So, $16 milk was real good. 2004 was a good year. Um, you know, $9 income over feed cost. We got to 2007 and basically, and, and Alan Levitt said this in the 11 o'clock seminar, um, that the price levels had changed. That we're in a different world since 2007. Not only the price levels, but the amount of volatility on both the milk and the feed side. Okay, so when you make, be careful making comparisons to periods before 2007 because it's just not relevant anymore when you're talking about the price movements in those series. So 2007, 10, 66, that's the highest income over feed cost that we have, um, that we've seen, at least in the 20 years we've been looking at this. 2008, $19 milk. Look at that jump in feed cost, 1254. That's a pretty good increase from where we had been in the $7 range. Uh, 1254, remember what happened in 2008? That was we had extremely high, well, we thought they were at the time high, uh, corn and soybean hay prices, right? That turns out um, they can get higher. And uh, in 2009, we had that collapse. I'm actually surprised that that's positive. But again, remember, I told you these are biased. This is not, they're, they're, there are some farms that are not reflected here that would be, that did much worse than that. And there were plenty of negative farms in here, but I'll just call that zero, okay? <laughs> and, and look at this income over feed cost, $1.96. That means all you've done is pay for the feed. And you got a dollar ninety-six left to pay for the labor, the management, the utilities, the fuel and oil, the replacements, the return to capital, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. 2011 um, has bounced back up. 2012 is going to look well. Which year is 2012 going to look like? Probably more like 2009, right? Hope hope not. But and, and you can see if you look at this that the uh, the total feed cost reflects an increasing amount of homegrown feed in there too. And you see that from these farms. Okay, so here's the, I've got tables that you're gonna see worse than this, sorry about this. Th these are um, dairy farm revenue sources of the same 10 year period and probably what I should have done was taking a couple years off so I apologize about that. Here's your milk price. Uh, this is the cull values. Okay, and you can see in the higher years either, either the cull prices were higher or they were culling heavier or both, right? Because those, both those effects in there. This is uh, steers and heifer uh, income, again, all in dollars per hundredweight. Here's government payments. And that's not just from the dairy enterprise. That would be any government payments that they have from crop enterprises as well. And here's your total income. Um, and again, you know, really we're in a different world here. Uh, so since 2007, that's, that's what we're focusing on. These numbers down here, um, you know, $15, $18 is not going to do it at our current prices. Here's the top cash expenses, cash expenses now. Um, we don't have depreciation in here, which would be the third biggest expense if it was in here, for example. So purchase feed, you can see we went from a situation where, you know, we were in that three and a half, four bucks to now we're in the five or six dollars purchase feed. And at the same time, we're growing more of our feed than we were before. So the feed cost, that's masking some of the feed cost increase. Hired labor, um, you know, you can see where the increases have been. Um, Everything's been increasing, but really where you see it the most in the volatility is in the purchase speed. Okay, so why is risk management important? Well, risk management um, helps you as a dairy farm manager prioritize where your efforts should be. Okay? Um, just the increased awareness 
of what these effects could possibly be is going to help make, I hope, make decisions on where you should be spending your effort. Okay, it helps you make better decisions, both strategic long-run decisions, like should we be growing more of our own feed, or should we be, you know, sending the heifer enterprise someplace else, um, as well as operational decision making. And risk management, especially if it's backed up by accrual adjusted accounting and, and financial statements, can help you uh, have an early warning system, okay? Everybody has at least cash accounting because you've got to file taxes. Okay, that Schedule F that you file is a terrible measure of what your cost of production and profitability is on dairy enterprise because of the accrual adjustments and the allocation issues across enterprises. Okay, so if you look at the balance sheet and income statement, you have an accrual adjusted situation with that change in uh, um, inventories and feed and things like that, you have a up to two years earlier, you're going to see a problem coming than you are if you're just doing a cash accounting. Okay? By anticipating the potential events, the, then you become more agile and you're better able to uh, respond and be proactive. So there's a whole series of questions that need to be asked in assessing the farm's risk situation. So what are the risks? Okay? Low farm milk prices, high purchase speed and the effects that, that can have on your cash flow and liquidity situation and your solvency. You know, what's the probability of occurrence? There are a whole lot of people, um, and actually in Michigan State, we have probabilistic milk and feed price forecasts on the web. And um, the last time I talked to Mark Stevenson at the University of Wisconsin, um, he was preparing to put uh, up an even better set of long run milk and feed price forecasts, probabilistic forecasts, and in, in fact, forecasting the margin. And so there's lots of places you can go to look and go through the exercise and see, um, you know, talk to a broker if you're working with one. What's the magnitude? Well, I want to spend a little time on this as we move forward. Estimate the potential shortfalls in income and cash flow. Which tools and strategies are available to address this risk? How big are the possible price swings? Well, you know, we still have a support price of, of $9.80 in terms of 3.5% butterfat uh, milk. Um, as a side note, um, there's been a lot of press lately on how the Farm Bill expired and um, now the Ag, Agricultural Act of 1949 is underlying legislation for the price support program, which says that if they don't do anything else, then the price support for milk as of January 1 is now $38.78 a hundredweight. Well, actually, it's somewhere between $38.78 and $51, but it's not going to happen, okay, because uh, they'll either pass a continuing to um, keep the old, uh, most recent farm bill uh, going, or U USDA will uh, drag their feet in implementing this because it's not like you flip a switch on January 2nd and we have that price support. USDA has to actually go out and purchase the products to make it be supported at that price, which means that they have to have buyers out there, which they don't have now because they're basically not buying anything, and all the products have to be packaged for long-term storage and meet the USDA specifications, which is not in general how um, manufacturers package, package their products. So um, I wouldn't spend a lot of time counting on a $38 price support, but it would be really interesting as an economist. It would be a really interesting experiment. So how big are the possible price swings? Well, assuming we don't go to $38 support price milk. By the way, it would be stable at 38 That would be a stable milk price. So we would not be talking about volatility anymore. I'd find something else to talk about, but it wouldn't be volatility. So what factors are you making your business vulnerable to risk, cash flow, and solvency? Well, we're going to utilize some budgets and financial statements to talk about that. Here's a key question. How large a loss can you afford? Okay, and you have to know where you're at financially in order to estimate this. Okay? You have to determine how much equity you have and how much do you need. What's your maximum allowable decline and what's your annual cash carryover? And I'm going to do I'm going through these quickly because I'm going to do more on this in, in a moment. Okay, so how do you handle risk? Well, in general, you either shift risk through contractual arrangements. That's what insurance is. You're paying somebody else to take the risk. That's what your car insurance is. That's what crop insurance is. Okay, that's what dairy LGM is. You're paying somebody else to take it. You're shifting it to somebody else. And you're going to pay them a little bit for that. You can, so insurance and hedging would be examples of shifting risk. You can reduce risk. Um, and there's, you do lots of things every day that reduce risk. 
like reduce the risk of mastitis through your milking procedures and things like that, um, through repairs, through your vet medicine. And you can reduce risk by changing the enterprises that you grow and perhaps trying to find some less risky enterprises. Uh, if you're not doing anything, you're basically self-insuring. Okay? And you can avoid risk. That's another way. So um, let's talk about, and I've kind of alluded to this, but there are three dimensions to farm profitability and financial health. Okay? There's, um, or there's profitability, which is generating enough income to cover your expenses. There's solvency, okay, which is possessing enough assets to more than cover your liabilities. So a farm is solvent if they have positive equity or net worth. So you have more than enough assets to cover your liabilities. And then there's liquidity or cash flow, which is having the money available when the bills come due to pay them. And you can have problems in, in any one or all three of these dimensions. Uh, okay? So you can have a business that um, is solvent and would be profitable if it would cash flow. And what do you do then? Well, generally, you go get an operating loan. right? That's why you get an operating loan, because perhaps the sales are coming later in the year and you don't have enough money to pay the expenses up front. So that's what that line of credit is about. And in order to track your farm financial situation, you need to have a balance sheet. Well, you need to have two for every year. The ending one of 2012, for example, will be the beginning one of 2013, and so on and so forth. And the balance sheet can tell you whether you're solvent. Okay, so a balance sheet is a list of all the liabilities and the assets. And um, debt to asset ratio is, is a, a measure of solvency. So it literally is the farm liabilities divided by the total farm assets. And you want that to be below 0.6. So the, that's the ratio of the amount that somebody else owns of your assets. So the higher that gets, the riskier it is. And your creditors, they get paid first if something happens, right? So the higher that number is, and we used to say 0.7, and we've been saying 0.6 more recently um, as far as where you want to be. You want to be less than 0.6. And if you look, if you go talk to creditors, they will track this, and people who get above a certain threshold, 0.6 or 0.7, we're going to pay higher interest rates. They're going to pay a risk premium. Okay, so it has direct effects on your expenses too when you get in a situation where you're getting closer to being insolvent. And the liquidity, one way to measure it is the current ratio, which is current farm assets divided by current farm liabilities. And we want that to be above 2, um, at least. We'd really like that to be above 2.0, which means you have twice as, so um, that's not just your cash, that's the things that you're going to likely convert to cash in the next year versus your expenses that you have in the next year, which would include the payments on the long, on the term debt as well. So the higher is better on that one. And, and I was discussing earlier today, I, one thing that we want to go back and look at and see is, is too high enough anymore? Are we in a situation where we're so volatile that we really need to be above that? Okay, so that's from the balance sheet. The income statement tells you what happened during the year and helps you calculate rate of return on assets by getting you the operating profit. And the cash flow statement is the third one, and it's the one that's least likely that somebody would be doing, um, which is just the statement of uh, timing, usually monthly, bi-monthly, or quarterly, of where the cash went and how it came in. So we got to cover, all, the COP stands for cost of production. We got to cover all the costs in the long run. And that includes a fair return to your management of labor or you should be doing something else. Okay, but the variable costs have to be covered in the short run. And, and, and so sometimes you get into a situation where what you're doing is looking through, getting through a short run situation, making certain that you can meet those so that you can be around to worry about the profitability in the long run. The cash flow uh, is going to consider the timing and the ability to cover the short run cost. So I want to pivot from that kind of background to um, risk-related dairy farm management situations. I want to talk about stress testing on your farm, which is very similar to the bank stress testing that we did uh, so successfully here in the last couple of years. All right, and then I want to talk about liquidity requirements. I'm going to talk just briefly about the use of price risk tools, and then I'm going to finish up with renting land versus buying feed. Okay, so again, there are, uh, I apologize, there are dozens of topics I could be talking about. I've got to figure out something I can finish up in a timely matter, and I'm not doing that great on the timing anyway. Uh, so, real briefly, uh, there's lots of different versions of this out there. You can search on the web and find some tools if you want, but essentially this is what we did with the big banks a couple years ago. When I say we, I mean the, not me, the United States government. Uh, what, 
how stressed are they and what can they withstand. You can do the similar exercise uh, with the proper amount of uh, records on your farm. You generate a cash flow statement, um, and it would be better if it was three to five years so that you had some good years versus some bad years in there. Okay? So where, and does that literally means breaking out where, how, when did the money come in and from where, and where did it go out, and at what time. Okay? Produce a cash flow budget. So a cash flow statement is uh, what happened. A budget is forward looking. So you're projecting for this next year the cash flow budget. Um, use the most likely milk uh, price and feed costs, for example. So um, you can go to the futures market. Um, we're trading both milk and corn and soybeans out far enough that that would be pretty much the best guess you could get on where the price is going to be in the next year. Examine a worst case scenario with potentially lower and higher milk feed prices. So you'll see in, in a second, I'm just going to use 2009 as the worst case scenario. Um, and hopefully, I don't have to redo that after 2012 as the worst case scenario. Okay, so how large are those potential losses if we have a worst case scenario? Then if you're going to have losses, consider where the cash is going to come from. Are you going to borrow it? Are you going to have to sell some assets? Hopefully, you're only going to be selling current assets and not the longer term assets because when you sell longer term assets, you shrink the size of your business. Okay, is it going to be borrowed sale of, or is it going to be outside sources? Are you going to borrow it? Uh, operating loan, for example. And then examine the solvency position under the worst case scenario. So if you have to borrow money here, what does that do to your solvency position? Okay? And this, again, this is, um, this is at the end of 2010, because I didn't have the 2009 records in here. This is herd size on the dairy farm, um, Michigan Dairy Farm Business Analysis Summary. And, and so these are nobody's specific number. These are averages. Okay, this is beginning current ratio, and this is ending current ratio if we have another 2009, okay, another year like that. And so you had a situation where at the end of 2009, which remember was a terrible year, terrible year, uh, if they had had the second year in a row like that, um, basically these herd sizes um, had no margin of error on their cash flow. It was a one-to-one, -one, okay, and, and everybody was in the kind of danger zone. Okay, and this is, these are averages. That, there were farms here that were well below one. So they just weren't in a position without some external funds or selling something um, to be able to cover their cash flow if they had another year like 2009. Okay, and, and you, you know, this really doesn't mean that much to you. This is just the exercise, and that's the point of it. You need to go home and think about the situation on your own, right? And if you need help from extension or an accountant or something, that you should get some help um, with doing this kind of analysis. But it's, it's fairly straightforward. And then this one, now these farms on the, uh, in the Michigan in our business analysis summary have a lot of equity. Um, like I said, we have really, we're good farms. Okay, so none of these, here's how big the loss would be um, that it, uh, loss in equity was for those different groups, okay? from 2009, so this would be a repeated loss in equity. But, th but these guys, um, none of these guys are in the danger zone, although that one's maybe getting a little higher than you'd want to be. But, this, the, but the, the key here is, what's your situation, and the closer you get to the danger zone, the more important it is that you take that into account when you're making your feed decisions and any milk marketing decisions, okay? Because the closer you get to having a solvency problem, the more important it is that even if you do miss out on some upside, you make certain you don't have the low side. Um, this is the results of a survey that I'm finishing up analyzing from five states, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, California, and Florida, uh, that we did this last year on. I asked them, did they use these milk price tools? Um, did they use them last year? So this was earlier in 2011. So did they use it uh, in 2012, sorry, did they use it in 2011? Did they use it in the three years before that? Had they basically ever used it? And what we found in Michigan and other places is that for the most part, people use the feed price tools more, okay, forward contracting feed and stuff, which is also related to tax management, um, and had used the milk, uh, milk uh, tools less. 22% of the Michigan farms had used milk uh, price risk tools, meaning forward contracts, futures, and options. And, and they definitely had used it more Recently, as you'd expect, you're seeing an increasing percentage of people using these tools, which you'd expect with the increasing amount of volatility. Um, and the reason that the people that had never used these tools, which I think is kind of interesting, 
lack of knowledge was the biggest one. This is for milk price tools. This is for feed. Uh, 25, 26% because they didn't have enough knowledge on how to use these tools. Uh, you know, 10 to 13% because they, of the basis risk. Because remember, even if you're hedging, right, you still have the basis risk. You know, things like a negative PPD will teach you that in a big hurry, um, which we don't expect, but it does happen. Um, cost was a big reason. Lack of management. Time, I think, was really important. And by the way, if you, um, these are not presented by herd size, but it was much more likely that you use, use these tools if you were more than 300 cows, which you might expect. Because another reason is, the contracts being too large is not an issue as you get to be a bigger and bigger herd. Um, inconvenient, difficult to use. 13% that hadn't used the milk price tools said, listen, I got a co-op to market my milk and that's what they do. And by the way, we have co-ops that are really good at it. And that might be a perfectly rational decision, okay? That you focus your management time elsewhere, okay? But the closer you are to having financial problems, the more, the more important it is that you think about underlying some of these, okay? With with an insurance product of some sort, whether that be an LGM or a hedge or a forward contract or, or what have you, an option. So price risk, and one of the reasons that people hesitate to use them, I think, is, uh, is that price risk management tools, because they're an insurance product, they're, they're usually the second best solution. You look back, when you look back on it, you think, well, geez, I, you know, I spent money and I didn't get anything back for that. Uh, which, by the way, I, I would personally argue is not necessarily risk management. Um, or you look back and you say, I should have locked it all in. As I've talked to somebody on that, their regret was they locked in a third and they should have done everything. So there's always regret is the situation. And that's why the risk attitude in the management team is an important consideration here. I've kind of given up on the fact of, of trying to preach this as pure risk management. Because you know uh, people will say, if I'm going to put my time into it, it's got to get me some return at some level. And anyway. Maybe I'm being naive expecting it to be a pure risk management situation. But how much do you need to protect cash flow and how much do you need to protect equity need to be important parts of the discussion when you're formulating your risk management plan. And uh, finally, um, this is a monthly corn, soybean, and hay prices back to, what is that, 85? 85 through the, well, the most recent numbers. So uh, this is corn. Soybeans are the pink and hay is the green, and the hay is on this axis. That's why it looks similar, even though this is in dollars per ton. So basically, the story here is that we had, for the most part, low and stable feed prices for at least a 20-year period there. So for example, you guys will may recall this is 1996, and there's corn over $4. It seemed really high at that time, didn't it? And it was high for that time because we had an oversupply in the world. We had lots of stocks and we had low and stable feed prices. And that feed issue, it just wasn't a big issue most of the time. Unless you had some sort of train wreck with your production and didn't have crop insurance, <clears throat> it, it really wasn't that big a deal. So well, what about today? Okay, Buying feed 10 years ago was the preferred mode. Okay, for virtually everyone, which is why lots of farms were built on that model. It was a completely rational way to set up your farm, by the feed. Since 2007, with the energy, and energy price volatility and other factors in the world market, growing feed has been the dominant strategy. And so really, we've seen a lot of growth in the areas where they grow their own feed. This is from 2001. This is from a study we did um, 10, 12 years ago on Michigan dairy farms where we did enterprise accounting, where we uh, did, uh, Kathy remembers this, where we did every uh, expense, allocated every expense on the farm, including all the management, unpaid labor and everything. It was a lot of work for these farms. And this is just to illustrate what it was like 10 years ago to grow your own feed. We had corn that you could have bought in 2001 for a buck 72 a bushel. That was average price, okay? We had variable costs, and these are dairy farms now, not cash crop farms, so maybe the cash crop guys were lower a little bit. Of 232, total cost of 290 minus a buck 18. Corn silage was, was closer to breaking even on a percentage terms, but you still, and the, and the hay paid for itself, okay? And these are, this is a set of case studies, right? But it still, it was true in general that back in that time period, you might have been better off taking your own crop land, renting it to the neighbor, letting them grow the corn on it, and then buying it back. 
Okay? It was, it, in fact, it looked real good for a lot of these guys. We had farms decide that after looking at these numbers. That's not true anymore. So how much can you pay? It's not true in general. How much can you pay in land rent to avoid feed purchases? Because that's the big thing right now that you don't, geez, you don't want to buy $8 corn. So if you're going to grow the feed with rented land, then you have the land rent plus all the, all the non, what we're going to call the non-land costs. And I've got a grocery list up there, okay, of non-land costs that you're going to have. So let's go through a simple, sim very simple, mind you, uh, analysis of this. University of Illinois does a nice job on their corn budgets, so I took their non-land costs, uh, non-land costs for corn in Illinois. And this is for pretty productive land, not irrigated, 175 to 195 bushels per acre. And they had $509 of non-land costs in 2011, 520 this year, and they were projecting, that's why it says P516 next year. So I guess they're getting, expecting non-land costs to not go up. So if we decide that the maximum we could pay in land rent then, the maximum rent is the yield per acre times the feed cost in dollars per bushel minus the non-land cost. We can calculate a, a really simple, naive here, break even land rent across the corn price and yields given the non-land cost. And I just picked 515, but I could change this easily. I just did this in Excel. We could, we could do, run these all day long. Okay? And here, this, if it has a bracket, that means negative because this is Excel. Okay, so here's corn yield, 80 bushels an acre to 200. So, you know, you might want to go out further. And here's the corn price. And, and using that simple formula that I just had, here's how much you could afford to pay in land rent to not be buying feed, at, not be buying corn at that price. Okay? And so, you know, here we are. Look, we're at 8. We don't expect 8, by the way. Uh, that would be silly. Gosh, I hope we don't expect 8. Jim Hilker, who's at Michigan State, who does a really good job of forecasting uh, prices has a long run price of about five dollars a bushel in corn with lots of variation. So let's look at this row here. Okay, you know if we're going to well these these non land costs are five fifteen and that was for um, corn in this range right here. So that would be three eighty five. Okay, three hundred eighty five dollars an acre. I'm not suggesting anybody goes out and pays that. That's a cap. Okay, and, and you you wouldn't want to do that, um, but you could afford to pay a lot because let's look at what land rents have been. Yeah, these are Michigan land rents. We do this survey every year also. <clears throat> Here's Iowa. I couldn't find the Illinois ones. But let's look at the Iowa ones. They're 214, 252 average land rents. Um, you know, you could afford to pay more. And you know, what we also have going on with the land rents is that you have long-term agreements with the neighbor. I, I was, we were talking about this in my business management class last week in one of the um, Students in the class who's from a farm in, um, um, about by Cadillac, actually, came to me and said, we're paying $40 an acre for all the land we rent. And I said, uh, well, you might want to consider giving them a little more so that nobody comes in and bids it away from you. Because certainly there was a lot of, there's a lot of, at $40 an acre, there's a heck of a lot of room uh, to go higher. And then, you know, it happens. You get a long-term agreement with somebody and you don't renegotiate these things. But this is another place where you could, um, and by the way, go online because uh, University of Illinois and, and Iowa State both have really good worksheets on this um, called flexible cash leases, okay, where you set a base land rent and then you can adjust, adjust up or down from that, from that uh, land rent based on what the commodity prices are so that you're sharing with the landlord a little bit of the, of the higher prices if it goes higher and, and possibly he's giving back if it goes lower. But certainly there's a lot of room here. Um, and, and there's specific factors on where you're located and how far away the land is and is it in big parcels or small. But uh, certainly there's lots of room there um, for those prices to go higher and for you to still be okay um, growing your own feed on that. All right, so just to kind of wrap it up here. A lot of farmers have historically treated the input and output price risk as separate issues. Um, I've been saying for 15 years that they ought to be treated together. And now I think I was a little premature in saying that before 2007, but I'm much more confident that, that it's very important if you have one side handled that you, you, know, you handle them together. Have a good handle on what your feed cost is as well as your milk price. And you need to um, figure out what your financial position is because that's going to help inform what your marketing plan is and how you can handle the risk. And I'm not too late to have a few questions if you guys have any questions.
uh, Iowa State. Yeah, sorry. So the question was, what was the website? If you want, um, if you want cropland budgets or you want to look at the flexible leases, they both have an example flexible lease up there. And it was uh, University of Illinois, Nick Paulson and Gary Schnitke do a real nice job there. And um, Iowa State, uh, William Edwards has one. But I, I would probably, the Illinois one's probably more recent. Other questions? Thanks for your attention.